Lecture 6, Cloud Development and Precipitation. So, in this lecture we will be talking about how clouds form. Um, we've been talking about the different types of clouds and what they're made of, right, what they look like. But now we're going to get into the physics of how exactly they form or develop and what type of precipitation falls from clouds. Okay, so the outline for the lecture is atmospheric stability. We'll be talking about what it means for the atmosphere to be stable versus unstable. Turns out when the atmosphere is stable, upward motion is suppressed. Generally, there's downward motion that inhibits cloud development. When the atmosphere is unstable, there's upward motion and that can form um, clouds, especially uh, cumul form clouds, clouds of vertical development. How is stability determined? Okay, we'll talk about that. How you can look at upper air temperatures um, to help determine whether the atmosphere is stable or unstable. The types of clouds you'd expect with different atmospheric stability conditions. How does precipitation form? Okay, precipitation processes refer to those mechanisms in which precipitation grows from either tiny cloud droplets or um, small ice crystals. Recall that the average raindrop, average size raindrop, about two millimeters, is a um, hundred times larger than the average size cloud droplet in terms of diameter, which is only about 0.02 millimeters. So the volume of the average your average raindrop being a, and the raindrop being a spherical shape is about a million times that of the average cloud droplet. Okay, so how does the cloud droplet grow so much to become a raindrop? We'll talk about that. There's many types of precipitation, right? In Northern California, lower elevations, we are used to rain, okay? Or some drizzle, especially along the coast. But there's snow, okay? The one form of frozen precipitation. And there are other forms of frozen precipitation. Sleet, hail, freezing rain. How do they form? Okay. And how is precipitation measured? You may have heard of a rain gauge. We'll talk about how that works. Okay. So the reading for this lecture is chapter 5, pages 116 through 147. And just so you know, this is a very in-depth chapter. That's why we've spent a couple weeks on it. Okay, there's a lot of material, there's a lot of concepts. It could be split into three separate chapters, really. Okay, so hopefully um, you study the notes well and do the reading and um, work on the homework um, with uh, great concentration. Okay, let's start with talking about stability. In order to help understand this concept of stability more generally, let's go over a nice uh, example to help illustrate it. Suppose that you have two systems in equilibrium, and the two systems are, one, a rock at the bottom of a valley, okay? So there's a rock at the bottom of a valley surrounded by hills on either side, and the other system is a rock on the top of a hill. Question, let's suppose each rock is given a push, okay? You exert a force on each rock. What will happen, okay? Well, first of all, what will happen to the rock at the bottom of the valley? Well, it'll, if you give it a force, it'll start to move upward, but it will come back down, right, due to the force of gravity acting on it, okay? For the rock on the top of a hill, if you give it a force, right or left, it will start going down the hill, and then what? It will continue to roll down the hill due to the force of gravity. It will roll faster and faster, right? And it will not come back to where it started from, um, naturally, unless a new, for a new force is given on it, okay? So, this first set system, the rock at the bottom of the valley, is a, an example of a stable equilibrium, because... When it, uh, the system is given an initial force, it's given a change, it will tend to return to its original position. But the second system, the rock at the top of the hill, is the, um, a case of an unstable system. 
because given an initial force, right, a push, it will re it will then move to a new state, right, an entirely new state at the bottom of a new another valley, and it will not return to the original position. Okay. So here's a figure to illustrate what we were talking about. Okay. You have rock A at the bottom of the valley. There's a man sitting on it. It looks like he's a he's a scholar. Okay, see how he has his uh, hand on his chin, and he hmm, he's thinking, well, what's going to happen if I push the rock up to the uh, right? Okay, and by the way, that's a huge rock, right? That's almost as big as him. Okay, big rock, boulder. Okay, he's pushing it up, right? He's using a lot of energy to push that big heavy rock up. Then what happens? Okay, it's heavy and the force of gravity on it is strong, comes back down and it knocks him over. Okay, hopefully not too hard, right? We don't want to injure this guy, okay? Uh, then we have the rock at the top of this hill. Here he is. And he pushes it to the right now and it takes a lot of energy to get that heavy rock rolling. But once it starts rolling, it's going to roll faster and faster and it will not come back, okay? So... Hopefully now you have an understanding of stable versus unstable equilibrium, okay? The force that moves the ball back to its original position in the example of the stable equilibrium, is, which is the force of gravity, is called a restoring force. Now, how would you define stability in the atmosphere? Okay, we're talking about these rocks on in valleys, at the bottom of valleys and hi tops of hills. But what about in the atmosphere? What is meant by atmospheric stability? Ideas? Well, think about what we were talking about at the first slide. When the atmosphere is stable, generally uh, there's downward motion and uh, cloud development is suppressed. Okay? Generally, atmospheric stability is associated with boring weather. Whereas instability is associated with upward motion, uh, uh, can be associated with thunderstorm development, and very exciting weather. Okay. So, in order to determine stability in the atmosphere, one must know, uh, be able to understand some important terms. Okay, because these terms are useful for understanding if the atmosphere is stable or unstable, and we'll go through uh, details about them. They are. An air parcel, we've talked a little about it. Adiabatic, what that means is basically no energy or heat is exchanged uh, between a parcel and its surroundings. Okay, we'll talk about that. Buoyancy, right? If something is uh, positively buoyant, it will rise on its own. Okay, we'll talk about this. Positive buoyancy is associated with atmospheric instability. We will be talking about adiabatic lapse rates, dry and moist, okay? They basically determine how uh, much a parcel of air is going to cool with increasing height per, so basically how much, say, a parcel cools for every thousand feet you go up, okay? Um, degrees Fahrenheit for a thousand feet or degrees Celsius for a thousand meters, okay? There's in the dry and moist Lapse rates differ in whether the parcel is saturated, um, relative humidity is 100%, and it's releasing latent heat through condensation, or it's not saturated, it's relative humidity is less than 100%, you wouldn't see a cloud, it's quote-unquote dry, but not completely dry, okay, but dry in the sense that the relative humidity is less than 100%. You've heard of the environmental lapse rate from chapter 1, that's just the temperature um, the rate at which temperature decreases with increasing height in the um, atmosphere, okay? But it's different from the adiabatic lapse rate in that the environmental lapse rate is basically the uh, temperature at which the, in, the um, surrounding air will cool with height, okay? The outside environment, but the adiabatic lapse rate refers to the rate at which a temperature of an air parcel, like a bu balloon or bubble of air or a thermal, will cool with height, that's indip That's basically um, not exchanging heat with its surroundings. It's closed off to the surroundings. That's what we mean by adiabatic, okay? So air parcels are basically theoretical bubbles of air. And 
these bubbles do not exchange heat or moisture with the surrounding air. And you can think of an example of an air parcel as being the balloon, right? Here's a red balloon, okay? You used to play balloon with balloons when you were kids. The re reason we can think of um, the air parcel as a balloon is because the air parcel does not exchange heat, energy, or moisture with the surrounding air. So it's basically isolated from its surroundings, kind of like a balloon, okay, right? The air in the balloon can't exchange energy or moisture with the air outside the balloon, right? Unless the balloon pops, okay, and then it's not really a balloon anymore, right? You see what I'm saying? Similar with an air parcel, okay? Does not exchange energy or moisture with its surroundings. And these air parcels are commonly used by meteorologists to help assess the stability of the atmosphere, okay? So air parcels that do not exchange heat with the environment are called adiabatic. And these air parcels that are adiabatic can only heat up or cool down in two ways. There's only two ways in order to change the temperature inside these air parcels, okay? One is through expansion or compression. Recall um, from an earlier lecture, we were talking about as an air parcel rises in the atmosphere, it cools, right? The reason is as an air parcel rises in the atmosphere, the pressure on it decreases, so therefore its volume has to expand, and it takes energy for the volume to expand, and that energy, loss of energy that's used to make the volume expand shows up as a decrease in temperature. Conversely, if an air parcel sinks in the atmosphere, pressure on it increases, so the volume decreases, it becomes compressed, and work is done on it, and that work shows up as an increase in the kinetic energy therefore, the, of the parcel, therefore the temperature goes up, okay? Now, air parcels can also cool in one other way. You might be wondering, well, how? Okay, they're not allowed to exchange heat with the environment, so how else could they cool, okay? Well, through the release of latent heat. Phase changes of water either absorb heat from the environment or give off release latent heat inside of the parcel, okay? Um, so yeah, not with the environment, uh, because the parcels cannot exchange energy with the environment, but there can be energy given off or uh, taken in from the molecules in the parcel, okay? So for example, if the water vapor in the parcel is condensing out, there'll be re latent heat released um, inside the parcel, okay, to warm up, right? If water is evaporating inside the parcel, um, then uh, that will show up as part a loss in temperature inside the parcel. But again, the parcel cannot exchange energy with the surroundings. Think of imaginary elastic covering the parcel like a balloon. Now, um, in order to understand whether the parcel is buoyant or not, we have to start comparing the parcel temperature with the temperature of the environment, okay? So it's not enough to see how much, right, or how fast the temperature of the parcel will cool with increasing height, okay? We have to compare what the temperature inside this air parcel is like to the environment, right? If 
an air parcel is warmer than the environment. If an air parcel at a certain altitude in the atmosphere, whether it be at the surface, whether it be at the cruising altitude of 38, 39,000 feet, depending on your airline, okay, and the weather, if the air parcel is warmer than the environment, it's less dense, therefore it rises. We say it has positive buoyancy. Make sense? Okay. If an air parcel is cooler than the environment, on the other hand, then it's denser than the environment, right? You can think of it as heavier than the environment, and so it will sink down. That's associated with negative buoyancy, okay? And an air parcel that's warmer than the environment and therefore lighter will continue to rise as long as it's warmer than the environment. When the temperature inside the parcel is the same as the environment, it will stop rising. Now, as an air parcel rises, it cools due to expansion. We've been talking about this. When the air in the parcel is not saturated, therefore the relative humidity of the air in the parcel is less than 100%, the dew point is less than the temperature, it cools at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Okay, It's called that, the adiabatic lapse rate for unsaturated air is called dry because um, it's drier than it could be, okay? The relative humidity is less than 100%, but don't be deceived. It's not completely dry, okay? Um, if it was completely dry, then the dew point would be absolute zero, okay? Now, what is the value of the dry adiabatic lapse rate? This is a very important um, value to remember. The dry adiabatic lapse rate has an average value um, of 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters can also be rewritten or converted into uh, English units from metric units. And so for every thousand feet a parcel ascends that's unsaturated, it will cool 5.5 or 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Conversely, for every 1,000 feet an unsaturated air parcel sinks or descends, it will warm up 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is an average value, but let me tell you, it's pretty, uh, it's going to be, the actual dry adiabatic lapse rate should be very close to this value, okay? It doesn't really change much. It's usually right around this value, okay? So this value is a very good approximation. Now, to illustrate uh, parcels cooling with height or warming with um, cooling with increasing height, warming with descent, decreasing height. Here is a figure from the book showing how as long as an air parcel is unsaturated, okay, it will cool with height at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Okay, so a rising air parcel expands and cools. A sinking air parcel is compressed and warms up. Okay, um, So the air parcel in this case kind of looks like a hamburger bun. has a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius near the ground. That's 86 Fahrenheit. Okay, This could be a summer day. And when it gets to an altitude of 1,000 meters, which is a little over 3,000 feet, it's cooled to 68 Fahrenheit. Okay, 68 Fahrenheit room temperature, and you notice it's gotten larger. Okay, 
by the time it reaches 2,000 meters, which is closer to 7,000 feet above the surface, okay, um, its temperature has dropped to 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's become a lot larger. Again, uh, think about the balloon analogy, right? As a balloon rises in the atmosphere, its volume increases, okay? It's, it's getting uh, bigger, although you might not be able to see that so much because you're deceived because as it rises higher in the atmosphere, it's looking smaller to your eyes because it's farther away, right? Um, so that kind of counteracts the sight that it gets bigger. Okay, that's about the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Now, what about that moist adiabatic lapse rate? Well, let's think about an example where an air parcel cools to the dew point temperature. As an air parcel rises in the atmosphere, it cools. Now, let's assume initially it's unsaturated, temperature is greater than the dew point. If it cools enough, the temperature will drop to the dew point, right? Dew point's less than or equal to temperature. It can't exceed it, okay? And that, so while the parcel is rising, the unsaturated parcel is rising, its temperature is dropping at 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet, but the dew point is not really changing much. Turns out the dew point lapse rate is about 2 Celsius per thousand meters. It's, um very small okay it's maybe one fahrenheit per thousand feet but it's almost the dew point really doesn't change with height because think about it folks think the air parcel is adiabatic it does not exchange heat or moisture with the surroundings so the amount of moisture in the parcel um if it's unsaturated remains constant okay if it's unsaturated it remains constant so you might ask well shouldn't the dew point be the same remain the same as it rises and sinks, because the dew point is a measure of how much water vapor is in the air, and the amount of water vapor in the parcel, if it's unsaturated, it's not condensing out, it's not changing. True, but the dew point is slightly affected by pressure, okay? Remember, dew point is the temperature at which you'd have to cool the air, assuming no changes in water vapor content or pressure. As the uh, parcel ascends, the pressure on it's less, the air is thinner, so it actually, the dew point decreases slightly. Anyway, um, let's suppose that the air parcel cooled enough to reach the dew point temperature. Well, what would happen? Could you see any effect of this with your naked eye, a rising air parcel cooling to the dew to point temperature? You could, because now, if the temperature dropped to the dew point and the air is saturated, any further lifting of a parcel will result in cooling and therefore, that water vapor will have to condense out, okay, because the air can't hold any more water vapor, okay. Um, and clouds form, right? Remember, when you have enough uh, vapor molecules condensing, right, into liquid droplets on the CCN, salt, dust, smoke particles, you start seeing clouds with the naked eye, okay. And that releases latent heat because condensation is a warming process in which latent heat is released. Well, this latent heat release offsets the cooling due to expansion. As the parcel now begins to rise above this level of, sat of condensation, it's called the LCL, lifting condensation level. It's the level at which you have to lift an air parcel to reach condensation, okay, LCL. The cooling is offset. It's still rising, it's cooling because it's expanding and it takes work to expand, but as it's rising now above the level of condensation, okay, latent heat is being released. So that's offsetting the cooling. It's still cooling, but not as fast. It's now cooling at the moist adiabatic lapse rate, which has a value of about, see the tilde, 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, or 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. Notice that's only about 60% of the value of the dry adiabatic lapse rate, okay? Um, and this moist adiabatic lapse rate is variable, though. It is somewhat highly variable, especially when, you, when the parcel gets high enough, the moist adiabatic lapse rate gets closer to the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Because think about it, as the parcel is rising higher and higher above... Um, 
the LCL with the condensation level, more water vapor is condensing out. Eventually, it won't have as much water vapor to condense out because it's becoming too dry, okay? And also remember, as it goes higher in the atmosphere, the air is becoming drier, okay? So with increasing height, the dry, the moist adiabatic collapse rate gets um, closer to the dry adiabatic collapse rate. But if you're closer to the surface and the parcel is really juicy, high dew point, the moist adiabatic collapse rate might be even less due to all that latent heat released, okay? Makes sense? I hope so. Now, environmental lapse rate is different from the adiabatic lapse rates. Air parcels do not warm up and cool down the same way the environment does, okay? Recall that air parcels that are adiabatic only cool in, one, in uh, two ways. Adiabatic expansion or compression, latent heat release. Not the case for the environment, right? Think about the methods of energy transfer in the environment. The lower atmosphere is heated up during the daytime and cooled down at nighttime through conduction, right? The, the actual environment, atmosphere surrounding air does exchange energy with other air molecules outside, okay? There's convection currents, right, that exchange energy in the atmosphere. There's radiation, right, he, you know, that's absorbed, right, Ab or the atmosphere absorbs outgoing infrared radiation, right, especially the greenhouse gases, okay, the atmosphere is fairly transparent to solar radiation, but it does absorb some, okay, sunlight. So the air outside of an air parcel has a different lapse rate, okay, um, because the uh, air outside the parcel cools up warms down or excuse me cools down warms up in different ways and the environmental lapse rate is the rate at which um the environment te environmental temperature changes with height the temperature of the rate at which the temperature outside an air adiabatic air parcel changes with height it's determined by weather balloon observations okay and it's highly variable, even more variable than the moist adiabatic collapse rate. But recall from lecture one, chapter one, back in the day, okay, the average value is 6.5 degrees Celsius per thousand meters or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. Oh, what you see is that the environmental lapse rate has an average value between the moist adiabatic collapse rate and the dry idea about the collapse rate, okay? Keep that in mind because we'll talk about how normally the atmosphere is in a condition of, is in its state of conditional instability, okay? Um, so, a weather balloon is launched and attached to that actual balloon is an instrument package called a radio sonde that measures temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, okay? And these are a group of uh, undergraduate and graduate um, students in the Department of Meteorology at San Jose State University getting ready to launch a weather balloon, okay? Um, this is the instructor, Craig Clements, a faculty member, okay? And you know this area, right? You, you know some of these buildings, right? CVB, Joe West Hall, CVA, okay? In this picture, that new building was not the new uh, housing building that's went up in the last year or so, um, really close to the event center was not built yet. Okay, this picture's a few years old. So, unstable versus stable atmosphere to review in the other order. Suppose an air parcel is pushed upward. And you guys, we'll be talking about ways to get the air rising, right? How does air rise in the atmosphere or what makes it rise? We'll talk about methods to get the air going up. In, in a stable atmosphere, an air parcel will resist, right? What's resist mean? Fight against, right? Not want to. Resist the upward displacement and sink, okay? So in a stable atmosphere, an air parcel will resist the upward displacement and sink back down. Think of the rock. Think of the rock, right? As at the bottom of the valley, right? Um, given a push, what happens to it? So I have a question. In order for this to happen... In order for the air parcel to want to sink and go back down to where it came from, would, after it, after it goes up, would the 
Air parts of temperature have to be warmer or cooler than the surroundings. Cooler, because it has to be cooler to be heavier, right? On the other hand, an unstable atmosphere exists where an air parcel, given an initial upward displacement, you give it a little push upward, and we'll talk about how that can be done in the atmosphere, right? Uh, up a mountain, um, along a front, okay, in an area of low pressure where the air comes together and has to rise, okay, due to convection. The air parcel will continue to rise on its own, okay? So you give it an artificial push, okay, and it will... Once it gets that initial motion upward, it will then continue to rise on its own. It's positively buoyant, free buoyant. And in that case, for that to happen, the parcel would have to be warmer than the environment, hence less dense, okay, than the surrounding air. Now let's look at, more closely, the atmospheric conditions for a stable um, environment versus an unstable environment. Okay. Here's a figure from the book. What you're looking at is an air parcel being uh, lifted up via a helicopter, right? And you have a couple of scenarios on the left and right. On the left, you have an unsaturated air parcel, okay? So its relative humidity is less than 100%. It will cool at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. It's quote unquote dry, but not really dry. Um, let's assume that the surface has a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Now, when the air, before it gets rising, whether nat whether on its own or um, being forced up by something, the air parcel at the environment, at the surface has the same temperature of the environment. So we have some warm surface air with a temperature of 30 Celsius, 86 Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. Focus on the left for now, okay? That unsaturated air parcel gets um, forced upward a thousand meters. What's its temperature now? 20 Celsius, right? Dry adiabatic lapse rate has a value of 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, okay? And so on. And so if you drag it up another thousand meters to 2,000 meters, now it's only 10 degrees Celsius in temperature or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And it's getting larger as it continues to rise up. Well, here this is the case where the environmental lapse rate is 4 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, okay? So the dry adiabatic lapse rate is 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. The environmental lapse rate is 4 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So as the air parcel rises, it cools at a faster rate than the environment, right? The, the dry adiabatic lapse rate value is bigger than the environmental lapse rate that value. Therefore, it cools faster than the environment so as it continues to go higher and higher, it has a tendency to want to sink back down, okay? And as it rises higher and higher, the difference in temperature between the parcel air, the air in the parcel, and the outside environment increases. So it has even more tendency to want to go sink back down, okay? Now, let's assume that at the surface, the parcel is saturated initially. So its temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, and its dew point is 30 degrees Celsius. That's some really warm and moist air, temperature and dew point of both 86 Fahrenheit. Okay, that's extremely muggy, sticky. Well now, because it's saturated, as it begins to rise up, as it's lifted up by the helicopter, right? You're driving the helicopter, okay? Um, condensation's happening, right? Already at the surface, temperature equals dew point. So any lifting will produce a cooling. And since the air already had as much water vapor as it could hold at that temperature, now you're decreasing temperature, it can't hold as much water vapor. Water vapor is forced to condense out. You see that as a cloud, and that releases latent heat in the parcel, okay? So now, for every thousand meters the parcel ascends, it cools at the moist adiabatic lapse rate, six degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So as a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius at thou uh, zero meters, 24 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters, 18 degrees Celsius at 2,000 meters, 12 degrees Celsius at 3,000 meters, it's cooling more slowly. Notice it's still cooling with height, still expanding, but it's not cooling as fast as a dry parcel because of the release of latent heat. Regardless, it still has the tendency to want to sink down because 
the moist adiabatic lapse rate is still greater than the environmental lapse rate. So the parcel is still cooling faster than the environment despite the latent heat release. Therefore, this case is a completely stable atmosphere. Whenever the env environmental lapse rate is less than the moist adiabatic lapse rate, the atmosphere is said to be stable. Whenever the environmental lapse rate is less than the moist adiabatic lapse rate, okay, so the environmental lapse rate is less than um, 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, the atmosphere is stable because it would be less than both moist and dry lapse rates, the environmental lapse rate would be, okay? So the parcel is going to cool faster than the environment and, sit and want to resist upward motion. Stable atmosphere, boring, okay, weather-wise. And the atmosphere can be made more stable in a couple ways. Okay, this is a stable atmosphere. Two ways to make the atmosphere more stable are to cool the surface air or warm the air aloft, okay? So in this case, initially on the left, the environmental lapse rate is 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. It's 20 degrees Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit at... Um, zero meter elevation and it's 14 degrees Celsius at a thousand meters. If you decrease the surface temperature by two degrees Celsius, cool the surface air, warm the air aloft by two degrees Celsius, then you decrease the environmental lapse rate from six degrees Celsius per thousand meters to two degrees Celsius per thousand meters. Okay. Important rule. As the environmental lapse rate decreases, the atmosphere becomes more stable, okay? Whereas the steeper the environmental lapse rate, okay, the greater the value of the environmental lapse rate, the more unstable the atmosphere is, okay? Um, when the environmental lapse rate becomes negative, okay, do you know what that means? That means there's a temperature inversion. And a temperature inversion represents a very stable atmosphere, okay? So here is a picture showing air pollution trapped under a stable inversion layer. This is a beautiful picture from a University of Utah. This is a valley, okay? And there's an inversion at the top of this layer, so that's a stable atmosphere, and all this pollution is trapped. There's a lot of haze particles, smoke particles, some dust particles trapped, here and they're reflecting sunlight scattering sunlight creating this nice glow okay but even though it looks pretty from above if you're inside here you definitely feel the effects of the pollution okay now let's talk about um, in more detail an unstable atmosphere we'll, we'll talk about a completely unstable atmosphere here, you have an environmental lapse rate of 11 degrees Celsius per thousand meters and once again we have helicopters lifting up air parcels. We'll start with the exact same temperature at the surface, 30 degrees Celsius, and we'll have a left case for unsaturated air parcel, a right case of a saturated air parcel. Now, the only thing changed um, is the environmental lapse rate. Remember how before it was faux degrees Celsius? Poor... Um, 1,000 meters, now it's 11 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, it's increased. Now, even if the parcel is dry, okay, quote unquote dry, the relative humidity is less than 100%, it's dew points less than the temperature. So it's going to cool at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it cools from 30 degrees Celsius at zero meters ground to 20 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters above the ground. Okay, and it continues to cool 10 Celsius per thousand meters every, yeah, 10 Celsius per thousand meters increasing in height. We'll look at the environment lapse rate. The environment lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. It's 11 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, okay? So, now I'll look at what's happening at each of these levels. The parcel is warmer than the environment because the environment's cooling faster with height than the uh, air parcel that's cooling dry adiabatically. So at 1,000 meters, air temperature inside this air parcel is 20 degrees Celsius. Temperature of the outside environment is 19 Celsius degrees Celsius. So it's warmer than the surroundings, 
it's lighter, it will have the tendency to rise on its own. If the helicopter let it go here, it would rise on its own, okay? And as it continues to rise higher, it gets even more unstable in the sense that its temperature difference, the temperature difference between it and the environment is even greater, and so it's going to want to rise even more, okay? Now let's look at a case where the air parcel at the surface is saturated initially. It will cool at the moist state of collapse rate, only 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. Now, parcel is only lifted 1,000 meters. It's cooled only to 24 degrees Celsius. The environment is 19 degrees Celsius. So it's 5 degrees Celsius, about 9 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the environment. So it definitely wants to rise. And as it continues to ascend, it gets even warmer than the environment, right? And so it wants to rise more, okay? So what you see is in this case for the saturated air parcel, it, it, it's even more of an um, unstable case than the unsaturated parcel because as it com it's becoming even warmer than the environment, so it wants to rise even more, okay? This represents an unstable atmosphere because whether the parcel is saturated or unsaturated, given an initial push upward, it has the tendency to rise because it's warmer than the environment. Whenever the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, the atmosphere is said to be stable. Again, when the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, the environment is said to be stable because if the environmental lapse rate has a larger value than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, then it ha then it's greater than both dry and moist lapse rates. So whether the parcel is saturated or unsaturated, it's going to be unstable. Okay. How can the atmosphere be made more unstable? By doing the opposite to make the atmosphere more stable. By warming the surface air or cooling the air aloft. By the way, there's a typo in the book, okay? So let's assume initially the environmental lapse rate on this air volume, okay, this rectangular solid of air, is six degrees Celsius per thousand meters, and you increase the environment, the warm, the air surface temperature to 22 degrees Celsius, and you decrease the temperature at a thousand meters by two degrees Celsius to 12 degrees Celsius. Now, the environmental lapse rate is 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, so it's increased, okay? Whenever the environmental lapse rate increases, then the atmosphere becomes more unstable, okay? By the way, there's a reason why thunderstorms tend to grow and, and be more likely and the atmosphere becomes more unstable as you go later in the day because it's getting warmer at the surface, okay? Destabilizing the atmosphere, okay? Now, it's very common for an air parcel to rise dry adiabatically until it cools to the dew point temperature, at which point the uh, lifting condensation level is reached. Thereafter, condensation begins, cloud forms, latent heat's released, and the parcel rises moist adiabatically. So while in the previous examples we looked at whether the parcel was initially unsaturated and remained so with height, with increasing height, or was saturated and remained so with increasing height, but often parcel starts unsaturated, reaches LCL, and then becomes saturated. So it's common for an air parcel to um, undergo both rates of cooling, dry adiabatic lapse rate and moist adiabatic lapse rate, okay? And here's a figure illustrating that, okay? So, there's an air parcel with a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius at the ground, same as the environment temperature there. The dry Adiabatic lapse rate, as you know, is 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. Now let's assume initially the parcel is not saturated, okay? And let's assume that it's the parcel temperature at the ground is 30 degrees Celsius, 
the dew point is 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So if the parcel rises 1,000 meters in height, its temperature drops to 20 degrees Celsius. Recall the dew point doesn't change much with height, so now its temperature equals the dew point, 20 degrees Celsius, okay? And let's assume the environmental lapse rate is 9 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So as it, it's lifted up via the helicopter 1,000 meters, its temperatures drop to 20 Celsius. It's a little bit cooler, just barely cooler than the environment. So it's slightly unstable, right? It's going to have the tendency to want to move back down. Now, let it go. But now, its temperature dropped to the dew point, so it's reached the lifting condensation level. Now, if you let, let it go, it will begin cooling at the moist adiabatic lapse rate. 6 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So now, as it rises 1,000 meters, it cools down 6 degrees Celsius, 20 minus 6, 14. 14 degrees Celsius temperature at 2,000 meters, which is in the mid-60s Fahrenheit. But the environment, the whole time, this whole uh, um, column, it's cooling at 9 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. Now, the parcel is becoming warmer than the environment. Okay? And because now the rising air is warmer than the environment, its surroundings, it's positively buoyant, it will rise on its own, okay? So sometimes, folks, all that's needed to form a cloud is a little bit of force lifting. The parcel initially might be cooler than the environment the first few thousand feet, okay? But if you can just get it upward a few thousand feet, whether it be up, the air is forced up a mountain, whether the air is forced to rise because it's coming together at the center of low pressure, whether it's forced up along the front, then that can be all you need, the tr trigger you need, because then it will rise on its own because it cools at the moist adiabatic lapse rate, okay, which is less than the environmental lapse rate, okay? Conditional instability exists when the environmental lapse rate, given by the abbreviation ELR, is between the moist adiabatic lapse rate, about 6 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, and the dry adiabatic lapse rate, 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. Okay? Air that cools dry adiabatically becomes cooler than the atmosphere and sinks in this scenario. But air that cools moist adiabatically stays warmer than the atmosphere and will continue to rise. Okay? Normally, the atmosphere is in a condition of um, a state, I'll say a state of conditional instability because I don't want to repeat the conditional word like two, like two out of three words, if you know what I'm saying, okay? Now there's a, t there's a example for you, okay? It's a little tough, it requires some thinking, but I think you can do it, okay? Let's assume at the surface, the air temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, right, 68 Fahrenheit. The dew point temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, and the environmental lapse rate is 12 degrees Celsius per thousand meter, okay? So already, you're seeing that the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, okay? That should tell you the environment is, is stable. Excuse me, the environment is unstable, okay? Remember, if the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, the atmosphere is unstable, okay? And an air parcel at the surface is forced upward to the level of saturation known as the lifting condensation level. Questions, okay? Questions. At what height will saturation occur? Will the air parcel rise on its own afterward? What is the air parcel's temperature at 4,000 meters? Okay. Why don't you pause the video and try to work this out yourself and see what you come up with. Okay, so the answers are saturation occurs at 1,000 meters. Okay, why? Well, the air at zero meters at the surface, air temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, two points 10 degrees Celsius, and you know the parcel's um, not yet saturated, okay? 
So it's going to cool by 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So at 1,000 meters, its temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, but that's what the dew point is, right? So now it's saturated. Well, will the parcel rise at this level? Yes, because its temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, but the environment's cooling at 11 degrees Celsius, is 12 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So if the environment temperature is the same as the air parcel temperature at the ground, 20 degrees Celsius, it's 8 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters. So the air parcel is now 10 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters. The air envi surrounding environment is 8 degrees Celsius. And the air parcel rises free buoyantly. Okay. What is the air parcel's temperature at 4,000 meters? This is where it gets tough. Um, tougher. Well, think about it. Initially, the air parcel cooled at 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So 20 minus 10 is 10. So now at 1,000 meters... Its temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. Now it's going to cool at the moist adiabatic lapse rate because it's saturated, right? So do the math. 10 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters. 10 minus 6, it's going to be 4 degrees Celsius at 2,000 meters, right? It's 4 minus 6, minus 2 degrees Celsius at 3,000 meters, minus 2 minus 6, minus 8 degrees Celsius at 4,000 meters, okay? Now, let's reduce the environmental lapse rate to 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, okay? So now, the environmental lapse rate, instead of being greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which means a stable atmosphere, the environmental lapse rate is less than the moist adiabatic lapse rate. So, Stable atmosphere. Now, can you work out um, the uh, level of saturation and if the parcel will rise afterward? Well, saturation still occurs at 1,000 meters, right? Temperature dry diabetically would drop to 1,000, would drop by 10 degrees Celsius to 1,000 meters. So the uh, parcel temperature is now 10 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters equal to the dew point. But the environment's only cooling at 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So what would the environment temperature be at 1,000 meters? Well, 20 minus 15, 15. So now the parcel temperature is 10 degrees Celsius at 1,000 meters, but the temperature of the surrounding air is 15 degrees Celsius. So the parcel is cooler than the environment and will sink. Right, if it's let go there, right, it will not be buoyant, it would sink. This represents a stable atmosphere and boring weather. Now, you might be wondering why we're we talking so much about whether the atmosphere is stable or unstable and this lifting idea and these values, right, and these comparisons between the air parcel temperature and vibrant temperature. Because Stability is associated with cloud development. Lifting of air parcels can form clouds, okay? Especially cumulu form clouds, right? Vertical development clouds. They form by lifting of air parcels, okay? And we know cloud, these, these cumulu clouds can eventually grow and form cumulonimbus clouds, which produce heavy rain, lightning, hail, thunder, tornadoes. The amount of instability helps determine the type of cloud development. Okay, so if the atmosphere, um, if there's an unstable layer of the atmosphere, not that deep, maybe only a few thousand feet deep, maybe you only get some cumulus clouds. But if there's a really unstable layer, um, tens of thousands of feet deep, right, maybe you can form a nice cumulus congestus or even cumulonimbus cloud. Lifting of air parcels results in cooling, condensation, and cloud development. Again, stability can form, affect air pollution, okay, as you saw. Now, what are some ways to form clouds, right? What are some ways to get the air rising to form clouds? Well, there's four principal ways to get the air rising to form clouds in the atmosphere. We'll be discussing each. First is convection. This occurs when air at the surface is warmed 
and bubbles of rising air or these air pockets, these thermals, um, go upward, okay? Topographic forcing occurs when air is pushed up a hill or a mountain, right? If air um, runs into a mountain, it can't go through the mountain, okay? It can go around the mountain, but sometimes it will also go up the mountain, okay? Um, and by the way, this is part of the reason why uh, precipitation totals are higher on the quote-unquote windward side of the mountain, the side of the mountain that's facing the wind, that's feeling the effects of the wind, because air is forced to rise up the mountain, squeezing out more clouds and precipitation, okay? On the other side of the mountain, the leeward side of the mountain, the air sinks down, that suppresses cloud development, okay? And there's less moisture because of the um, moisture that was wrung out on the other windward side, okay? San Jose rain shadow, okay? Convergence occurs where surface air flows together. It can't pile up in one place. It can't go into the ground, so it rises. And finally, frontal lifting occurs where air rises along a front. When one air mass and a front occurs where one air mass, one large body of air with similar temperature and humidity properties, collides with another air mass. Okay, a front divides those two different air masses. Let's talk about each of these for ways to develop clouds. So during convection, air bubbles rise from the surface. Recall that the ground is heated somewhat unevenly during the daytime, right? Different surfaces have different albedos and moisture properties. So some parts of the surface become warmer. They, the surface warms the lower air in, co uh, in contact with it in the lowest few inches of the atmosphere. So then you have these warmer pockets of surface air, right? Warmer than their surroundings, they're less dense, they rise, okay? If the air is very unstable, these rising air processes can cool to condensation and start to form cumul cumulus clouds. Remember, cumulus clouds can occur in fair weather, okay? And what's interesting is while air rises below the, cum the base of the cumulus cloud and in the cumulus cloud, air tends to descend on either side of the cumulus cloud. That's why it's common for these puffy cotton clouds to have spacing between them. We'll talk about why that is, but it has to do with when the um, air cools enough, it begins to, and uh, goes into higher elevations, it tends to spread out. Also, there's evaporation along the edges of the cloud, which is a cooling process, okay? So they have cooling, and so that, and spreading out, and so the air will then begin to sink back down, because it's cooler, right? Denser. So... Outside of a cumulus cloud, downward motion develops due to a convective current. Um, you think of a lava lamp and also the evaporation along the edges of the cloud. Okay, cumulus clouds are usually well separated. Now the shading of the surface by cumulus clouds can cause them to dissipate only to be reborn once heating resumes. Okay, so sometimes when a lot of these clouds form, that cools the surface, right, reflection of sunlight, and then that kind of turns off the trigger mechanism for them, right? And so, and so then they dissipate because the um, surface is cooler. That's decreasing the, the instability of the atmosphere. But then that once they dissipate, then it's clear again. The surface warms back up and they reform. And the difference in whether you have a small cumulus cloud or a towering cumulonimbus cloud is um, a function of stability, okay? How unstable or stable the atmosphere is, how deep the unstable layer is, okay? So, another illustration of convection currents along these, um, for, associated with these cumulus clouds. You have a couple cumulus clouds here that are separated, okay? You have rising air under them, the air rises, it begins to spread out, cools, okay, and it's and uh, evaporation along the edges of the uh, upper parts of the cloud along with the cooling due to um, adiabatic expansion cause sinking air on either side. Okay. By the way, the top of the cumulus cloud where the temperature now um, reaches, of the air parcel reaches the environmental temperature is called the equilibrium level. Okay. 
So here are some fair weather cumulus clouds, okay, and this picture was taken from a plane, okay. These are cumulus clouds building on a warm summer afternoon. Each cloud represents a region where thermals, those warm air pockets, are rising from the surface. The clear areas between the clouds are regions where the air is sinking, right? Sinking suppresses cloud development. And a conditionally unstable atmosphere can cause this scenario to develop. This figure from the book, which is another picture taken from a loft, shows cumulus clouds developing into thunderstorms during a conditionally unstable um, atmosphere over the Great Plains region okay, of the central U.S. Notice in the distance there's a cumulonimbus cloud with an anvil top that has reached the stable part of the atmosphere. Okay? When the cumulonimbus top reaches the stable part of the atmosphere, it begins to spread out. Okay? The, that, that stable region puts a lid on development. Right? Just like think of that putting a lid on your pot, right? It stops the water from boiling water from getting out of the pan or pot. Okay. Now, topography can help form clouds. Okay. And by the way, for convection, you saw that was on a small horizontal scale, five kilometers. Okay. The cumulus clouds are not very wide. Okay. Lifting along topography might take place over 150 kilometers. Okay, wider, greater atmosphere scale of motion than for convection. Horizontally moving air, right, moving horizontally, not vertically, is pushed up by a mountain. And that lifting produces cooling, condensation, cloud development, and so on. Okay. The side of the mountain subject to the winds, um, the side of the mountain where the, the winds initially make contact, okay, is that's the windward side. Okay, the other side of the mountain, not subject to the winds, the side of the mountain where the inner descends is called the leeward side. Okay. Orographic uplift is the phenomena where air is forced to rise up the windward side of a mountain. Now, as the air rises up the windward side of the mountain, it cools, condenses into clouds, and it wrings out moisture from the air parcels. Okay? Think of having a wet rag or sponge and wringing it out. Okay? So then there's less water vapor left. And as the cloud rises on the windward side of the mountain, once the air rises above the uh, lifting condensation level, the dew point decreases with temperature, okay? So once the air reaches saturation, now the air is cooling at 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters, the moist adiabatic lapse rate. But the dew point is also cooling at 6 degrees per Celsius per thousand meters. So think about what's happening. On the windward side, the air parcel is losing moisture, right? The dew point's dropping rapidly, okay? So you're losing moisture. Then when the air begins to go down the other side of the mountain, the leeward side, moisture doesn't magically return, so the air is drier, and it's also warming up, because now the air is sinking, so it's warming, and its relative humidity is dropping further, because it begins warming at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. The dew point doesn't change much, so now the separation between temperature and dew point is increasing, so the relative humidity is going down. Air that comes down the leeward side of the mountains is hot and dry, okay? Santa Ana winds are those strong offshore winds that form when air sinks down the uh, San Gabriel, Santa Lucia mountains, okay? We also have Diablo winds, Bay Area version of uh, Santa Ana winds, okay? So here's a beautiful figure from the book illustrating the rain shadow effect, okay? Um, here's a mountain... 3,000 meters high, so it's about 10,000 feet high, okay? And you have air temperature of 20 degrees Celsius at the ground, so that's 68 Fahrenheit, and a dew point temperature of 12 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, we said how the dew point de temperature doesn't change much with height. It does decrease about 2 Celsius degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, increase in height because of decreasing pressure, okay? 
and the environment temperature is dropping by 8 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So the environmental lapse rate is 8 Celsius per thousand meters. It's in between the moist adiabatic lapse rate at 6 degrees Celsius per thousand meters and dry adiabatic lapse rate at 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. Okay. So the air only needs to rise up to a thousand meters, a few thousand feet, the lower part of the mountain, in order to condense. Any further lifting produces cooling, forces water vapor to condense out, forms cloud. Okay. So air continues to cool, but not as fast. Okay. And by the time the air reaches the top of this 3,000 meter mountain, if you do the math, the temperature is down to minus 2 degrees Celsius, upper 20s Fahrenheit, and it's equal to the dew point. Notice once the parcel begins to cool moist adiabatically and condensation is occurring, temperature is dropping as fast as the dew point. So the dew point has dropped a lot, right? You've wrung out a lot of water vapor. Now the air starts sinking down the other side of the mountain, and what immediately happens is once air sinks, it will warm at the moist, excuse me, once air sinks, it uh, warms at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, always. Once air moves downward, it will warm up at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, okay? 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So negative 2 plus 10 is 8. So by the time it descends from 3,000 to 2,000 meters, temperature's up to 8 Celsius, dew point doesn't change much. It increases by 2 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. By the time the air reaches 1,000 meters in elevation, the temperature is up to 18 degrees Celsius in the 60s in Fahrenheit range. Dew point hasn't changed much. It's still pretty low. Okay, that's a pretty low dew point. By the time the um, air parcel reaches the other, the uh, surface on the other side of the mountain. Its temperature is now 28 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Warm. Its dew point is only 4 degrees Celsius, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Warm and dry. As opposed to cool, cooler, and moister at the same elevation on the other side of the mountain. For reference, this is a real world example. Um, now, just to tell you, the Santa Cruz Mountains are nowhere near 3,000 meters high, okay? The highest parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains are about 3,000 to 3,500 feet high, about 1,000 meters. But you still notice a substantial difference in temperatures and precipitation amounts along the, the, um, on, the, on the sides of the mountains at the same elevation, especially near sea level. Santa Cruz is at sea level, basically, on the... Um, windward side of the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. And average precipitation, average annual precipitation there is almost 31 inches. It's a lot, okay? Average July high temperatures are in the mid-70s. But San Jose is at the same elevation on the leeward side, right, of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Average precipitation per year is only 15 inches, okay? Less, basically half or so of Santa Cruz average yearly rainfall. By the way, in the last few years, San Jose average rainfall, or San Jose yearly rainfall has been even less at times, right, uh, with the drought. And average July high temperatures in downtown San Jose, 82 Fahrenheit. But in South San Jose, we're in East San Ho, more like 87, 88 Fahrenheit, right? So you get the idea. In the Northern Hemisphere, mid-latitudes, and in the southern hemisphere mid-latitudes, generally, for north to south-oriented mountain ranges, which are common, especially in North America, right? The Rockies, the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada, the Coast Ranges, the Appalachians. The windward side of the mountain range is the western side, because air travels, tends to travel from west to east. Weather tends to move from west to east, okay? Whereas... The eastern side of the mountain ranges, the north to south oriented mountain ranges, in the mid latitudes, are the leeward sides. Okay. Exception is if air is traveling the other direction, right? So if air is traveling the other direction, it would reverse the sides. Although the thing is, like in, say, California, when air travels the other di direction, it's the offshore winds. Okay, where the air is traveling east to west, 
generally the air that comes from the interior part of the state um, valley and higher elevations it's dry so you're not going to see much precipitation formed okay but but in Hawaii in the tropics generally there's trade winds much of the year they're called the trade winds generally they blow from northeast or east so in Hawaii especially on the big island where all the mountains and volcanoes are right Mauna Loa Mauna Kea okay you can see all these beautiful volcanic eruptions right you got to go there if you haven't been there um on the eastern side of Hawaii is the windward side, okay? So it's amazing, the big island, how they can get so much precipitation, and it can often be cloudy on the eastern tip of the big island. But you go to the western tip of the big island, the other side, on the other side of all the volcanoes and mountains, it's very dry, it's often clear. You notice a dramatic difference in vegetation, okay? From more trees on the eastern side to more grass, right, on the western side, okay? The side, the uh, windward and leeward sides are reversed because the winds tend to blow from the other direction. Very interesting, okay? I think it's interesting. And speaking of cumulonimbus clouds, cumulus congestus clouds, and clouds, this is a picture taken from um, 2075 Lincoln Avenue. Okay, this is near Lincoln and Kirtner, facing east. Okay, um, several months ago, it's actually my um, massage um, place. Okay, and you have beautiful picture because you have some cumulus and cumulus congestus clouds, and then you have this cloud. It's either cumulus congestus trying to become a cumulonimbus, but the sunlight was reflecting off it, so it's very bright. Then you all this is in the distance. But you also see some alto cumulus clouds, okay, shown by this light to mild gray lump, mild light to mi mildly gray lumpy, puffy clouds, okay, and maybe even some alto stratus, okay. All right, and here's a truck, and another truck, okay. Although this truck looks more um, gangster than this truck, okay. So. Mountain waves are very interesting. The fact that air rises up the windward side of the mountain and sinks down the leeward side can form waves downwind of the mountain range. And that can form clouds downwind of the mountain range, sometimes hundreds of miles, uh, um, tens to hundreds of miles uh, downwind of the mountain. Okay, east in the mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere. Okay, the waves might resemble the waves those that form in a river downstream of a large boulder or rock. Okay, so you sometimes get these mountain wave clouds. They're called lenticular clouds. Have you ever seen these clouds that kind of look like a hat, right, covering the mountain? Okay, sometimes those same types of clouds can form downwind of the mountain because the um, this motion. This vertical motion up and down the mountain will produce these waves in the atmosphere. And also, rotors can form, which are violent um, pockets of air, okay, moving downward on one side, upward on the other side. And you guys, this helps figure, helps explain why turbulence is an issue around mountains. Because not only you have air changing direction in terms of going up or down above the mountain, but even downwind of the mountain. Okay, so if you're flying, you got even a few hundred miles away from the mountain, you're flying, you might run into one of these rotors where suddenly the air, the airplane is going up, okay, you're in a rising air current, then all of a sudden the plane falls quickly when you enter the other side of the rotor and the, that downward air takes the plane um, lower in altitude. Here's a picture taken by um, former San Jose State University graduate student Terrence Mullins, now a um, adjunct professor at several community colleges in Southern California. Okay, um, lenticular clouds in Western Washington. This is Seattle, the skyline. Here's CenturyLink Field. Here's Safeco Field. Okay, here's Mount Rainier. 
and look at these lenticular clouds. Okay. By the way, if you look closely and you see not only lenticular clouds on the top, but what I was telling you, downwind of the top okay, um, of the mountain. And uh, by the way, what do these lenticular clouds look like? Kind of like UFOs. Okay, so there have been over the years just numerous reports of UFOs that were really lenticular clouds. Okay, you if you want to see these, um, look at Mount Hamilton, Mission Peak, Mount Diablo. Okay, especially um, because those are the western facing slopes you can see from San Jose. You can't see the western facing slopes of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Although they sometimes can get these on the other side of Santa Cruz Mountains, okay? But especially on more um, weather-ish, weathery days where you have more uh, wind or you, or you see, or it could be a time around rain, these tend to form more, um, when there's more moisture in the air, okay? Because otherwise, if it's too dry, they won't form. Remember, they're clouds. They need moisture in the air. So... Again, we've talked about ways to develop clouds, convection, topographic lifting. We've gone into detail. We also want to talk about convergence and frontal lifting. So for convergence, basically you have air moving horizontally towards a single point. So this is a point on the surface and air is moving horizontally into it. Notice the air is coming in to this point from both sides. And this can happen, this is a two-dimensional figure, right? But this can happen in all directions horizontally. This is what happens at low pressure. Remember, in the northern hemisphere, around areas of low pressure at the surface, winds blow counterclockwise and inward. So the air is coming into the low from all sides. And if that air piles up, is it going to just stay there? And you're just going to keep adding air? right to that point no and it's not going to go into the ground and it's not going to go back out because the air is coming in right so what does it do it goes up it's forced to rise and when air rises it can form clouds which can produce rain okay convergence happens on a um, scale of a 500 kilometers okay finally frontal lifting can form clouds along a front one air mass Large three-dimensional volume of air overtakes another air mass, forcing air to rise. For a cold front, cold air pushes into warm air, and the warm air is forced up abruptly. That can form cumuliform clouds, cumulonimbus. For a warm front, warm air slowly rises over cold air. That can form nimbostratus clouds, producing rain. Okay, And weather fronts... The air masses and vertical motions associated with weather fronts can be on an entire horizontal scale of 1,500 kilometers. Okay, So we're talking about ways to develop clouds which can produce rain. Now we're going to start talking about precipitation processes. How do raindrops form? How do they grow so much? Okay, How do ice crystals form? Right? We'll talk about that.